Hey folks, welcome to the final online worship service of 2020. I know you're all sad to see this year go, but alas, we must say goodbye. Please hold your tears. So all joking aside, we're going to do something that we normally don't do with a worship set, which is I've got three songs lined up that talk specifically about one thing, which is God's love for you. And normally, we try and balance it. Uh, we don't want it to all be like, God loves you, you're so rad. Uh, we need to focus our love and adoration on the Lord. That's what praise and worship is for. But I just felt like for this message, for this weekend, a worship set talking about how much God loves you might be in order. So some of you might need to hear that at the end of this difficult year. The Lord is for you. He wants to bless you. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. Let's sing about it. But he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I Free. 
keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face toward you and give you peace Let it be.
Well, hello, everybody. One last Merry Christmas for you all. Hopefully you had an amazing Christmas with your families, friends, however you decided to celebrate. Hey, we just wanted to let you know that we still miss you. We miss you a ton, missing you here on Sundays, uh, but wanted to give you a couple of heads up going into the weeks ahead. First of all, if there's anything that we could be praying for, we seriously would love to be praying for you over these next couple of weeks. So go ahead and text prayer requests to 97,000. And then just wanted to give you a heads up on all the things that are going to be going on here in the new year. We're so excited to get back together with you guys. The kiddos have their Sunday morning kids blast, have a WANA on Tuesday night. Junior hires have their Sunday morning and then also junior high group on Thursday night. High schoolers, we have high school groups meeting back up on Wednesday night here in the new year. Adults, life groups, Lots of activities, lots of good things going on. Um, yeah, we really just want you to know how much we love you, how much we miss you. And yes, lastly, giving. We have been so encouraged. Uh, so cool to see how much uh, has come in and just see your faithfulness in action. And super stoked to see what the Lord's gonna do here in the new year. So if you're looking for ways to give, getting those last uh, year-end donations, you can do that online or mailing in a check. We'll make sure that that counts towards 2020. Now, I would like to pass it on to one of our elders, Mr. Doug Flake. Merry Christmas, everyone. Traditionally at ABF, we've been able to give pastoral staff bonuses based on the generosity of the congregation. And 2020, even though it's been a tough year, you've still been able to provide. And we've been able to give an end of the year bonus to each of our pastoral staff. So thank you, congregation, for your generosity. We appreciate it very much. If you wanted to give, the window's not closed. You can drop a check by the office or give online and mark it, mark it pastoral gift. We look forward to seeing you in 2021. Have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Well, thank you so much, Doug, and the elders and friends of ABF for that wonderful gift and uh, such a generous church. Well, today, December 27th, it's, uh, it's the last Sunday of 2020. For some of you, you're saying, this day hasn't come <laughs> soon enough. In fact, this year has been anything but normal. And it's probably caused you to ask this question, what in the world is God thinking? What is he doing during this COVID year that we've, uh, in many ways, had to endure? In fact, I bet for some of you, stress and worry and fear and isolation may have been more abundant in your life, unfortunately, than any other time in your life. And so the question is, what do we do? Who can we cling to? Who can you hold on to when you live in a world that is so unpredictable? And so I think you know the answer. I bet you the people on the couch know the answer. It begins with J. Yes, the answer is always Jesus. I don't care what the question is. If you say Jesus, like 95% of the time, you're going to be right. And so it is Jesus. It never gets old. But in this context, in John chapter 10, in fact, this is our 19th message in this series, Light the Dark, in the study of the Gospel of John, we see that he is the good shepherd, and we see another analogy that he's compared to. And so he is described as the good shepherd. He's described as our gate or doorway. And so what does Jesus do in times of uncertainty? He provides provision and protection to us as believers. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help this message penetrate the hearts of those who listen. May the messenger not confuse the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, take your notes. You'll have to have gone to your printer and printed these, these puppies. Hopefully, you have them in front of you right now. And well, let's look at the context. And first of all, let's look at the circumstances under that context. What's going on? First of all, who is this written to? So there's quite a debate here in John 10. If this is written to Israel, like Jesus is calling the, the lost sheep of Israel, uh, from, is, uh, from Israel, from Judaism to Christianity, or is it written to the church, or is it written to us as individual believers? I think it has application to all three groups. And in fact, John 10 is written from the shepherd's perspective. Uh, another famous passage, Psalm 23, is written from the sheep's perspective, and we all tie those two together. And as you can see in verse one, it says again, truly, truly, or he's saying, most assuredly, or another way of saying, you can take this to the bank 
And he's, interesting, he's probably teaching what we would now call the Temple Mount. And he's probably teaching from area from the northeast corner of Jerusalem at was what was known as the Sheep Gate of all things. And he is the Good Shepherd. So, now, there's a comparison, and you can see that in, in your notes. We're going to see the residence of the sheep in this passage, but it's very important that this, there are two different areas where he's describing the sheep and shepherd experience. The first is in the sheepfold uh, in the village in verses 1 to 5, and the second is the sheepfold in the country, verses 7 to 10. And if we understand this context, it'll help you understand what he meant uh, a little bit later. So when we look at the sheepfold in the village, I won't read all these verses for you, but in verses one to five, you can see he says, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And to him, the gatekeeper opens. So in the village, what would happen, there would be a communal pen, right? There'd be a communal pen. And I'll show you an example of this in the slide behind me. You can see the sheep entering into this village area. And it was tall and fenced and within the confines of a village. Now, each shepherd would inspect his sheep before it entered this communal pen. There might be four, five, six, seven different shepherds, literally dozens, even over a hundred sheep in this pen. And then they would drop them off. And a porter would watch them at night. It was kind of like babysitting service for sheep. And then the shepherd who's been out from the day, he had brought them in from the country. He can get a good night's sleep finally, and those sheep would be protected. In the morning, that shepherd would then pick up his sheep and they would simply call their names. Now, this is amazing to me. There's all these shepherds all saying different names and these sheep just would follow those individual uh, shepherds out of the pen and they would follow them out of the city gate or the village gate and back out to the grazing area. And uh, they might not have been uh, the, the smartest of animals, but they did know one thing. They knew who their benefactor was. Sometimes we forget that we're sheep and we don't listen to our shepherd's voice. And so at times we need to be reminded of that as well. Who is our benefactor? Now, some say this sheepful represents traditional Judaism and uh, so that, that Jesus was kind of calling the sheep from that. I thought it might be, but I, I think there's more here than just that. Now, the interesting thing is if they slept in the village, I slept in a, in a, uh, a dung hut in Kenya. And you can see the picture behind me. It looks something like that. And yes, it was made of that word. And uh, I was in this and they had a different setup there. Uh, the, the animals were brought inside the, the village gates and they could kind of roam freely. And so I was in this dung hut and this is years ago, taking college students to Kenya. And there was a big opening in the side of where I was sleeping. And in the middle of the night, some animal came and stuck. And my face, as I needed, I wanted some more air. I'm right by the opening of this. And something stuck its nose through and its tongue out. And I just, it freaked me out. And what is this thing? And uh, let's just say it was a very not good night of sleep uh, in that dung hut. So I, I've been there, done that. Now, if the sheep were out in the country, which is in the net section from verses 7 to 10, um, and you can see a picture there behind me uh, of uh, grazing sheep, uh, it says this, that Jesus said again to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. So he's the good shepherd. He's also the door. What is he talking about? All who came before me are thieves and robbers. We see that theme again and again. But he says in verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. And so what would happen out in the country, there would be this temporary enclosure. He would make it with rocks and brush and bushes and kind of find a closed in area. But there would be no door. And so he would literally lay across the doorway. The sheep could have, would, couldn't get past him and nothing could go over him. And literally he would lay down across the entrance and um, kind of a, enter at your own risk. Or if someone was going to come and try to take those sheep away, they would enter at their own risk. And it's kind of like, AKA over my dead body. Imagine Clint Eastwood as a shepherd. Are you feeling lucky, punk? Are you? Huh? I don't do Clint Eastwood very well. Um, or how about Arnold? Ah, the Terminator. Uh, make my day, you know. Uh, you can use your own accents and, and figure it out. The bottom line is that shepherd would literally put his life on the line for the sheep. Now, 
He's the door physically for the sheep, but here's the application in verse nine for us as believers. Spiritually, he is the door for our relationship to him. We'll see that a little bit later in John 14, six. So the, the key for sheep being happy is proximity to the shepherd. They stay close. And when they wander, they get in trouble, right? Isaiah 53, six, all we like sheep have gone astray. And isn't that true of us spiritually? We do fine when we stick close to God in our walk with him, but it's when we kind of do our own thing that we get ourselves in trouble. And that is so true of our life. So we got to ask ourselves, how did we do in 2020? As we kind of look back at this time, we, we can't say that I had no time for Jesus. Couch, did we have time for Jesus? We should have had plenty of time for Jesus. My goodness, we weren't going anywhere. We were stranded, yea, thus verily held captive. Oh, I'm getting out of, okay, we'll just leave it at that. So the bottom line is, could we have wandered a bit? Maybe we did. Let's make 2021 a better year. No matter what happens in front of us, let's stay close to our shepherd. Now, you're saying, how come you haven't read through the passage, these 18 verses, verses uh, verse by verse? Well, because there's so many different relationships and he says it like three or four times. So what I did is I packaged this next section so you can see who the main characters are or the relationship to the sheep. We saw the residents of the sheep. Now we'll see the relationships. How do they all play? And there are four key uh, ingredients in this. So first, you see the thieves, robbers, and strangers in verses 1, 5, 8, and 10a. Now the scriptures there behind me, I want you to study it with me. Verse one, that he who does not enter by the sheep or by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a what? Thief or robber. Very good, Josh, two points. Then verse five, a stranger will not follow, but they will flee from him for they don't know his voice because they're strangers. Verse eight, all who came before me are what, Josh? Thieves and robbers. And did the sheep listen to them, Josh? No, they did not. So that notice I'm only calling on Josh because Lindsay and Cheryl are sitting there very carefully studying the word and I will never embarrass my wife or Lindsay. But Josh is f fair game. Now, the bottom line is what would happen if they were out, uh, outside in the, in the country, uh, thieves might want to try to hop in over the fence or even in the village pen, try to hop in. They'd slit the sheep's throat, throw them over the fence and then pick up the, the, the loot later. Uh, and so the bottom line is, Jesus isn't that kind of guy, right? He's the protector. In fact, Jesus only comes into our lives invited. We know that from Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And so spiritually, he never forces his way in. He doesn't have to. We have to choose to willingly follow him. Now, uh, one uh, illustration that is, is interesting is, when sheep are used to one shepherd, they have a hard time ever following another shepherd. And in fact, uh, there are shepherds uh, that make some little side money out uh, in these areas even today when they have tourists come and he says, hey, just use these words. And he'll say, uh, you know, Ronald, come here. Come here, guy. Come here, Ronald. And the sheep follows over to his shepherd. So he goes to the tourists. Hey, call him, do exactly this. And they'll call Ronald and the sheep will go, Huh? Who are you? Using the exact same words, they don't know that stranger's voice. They don't know that tourist voice. I got some insight for some of, many of our students have been to a, a ministry called Patmos. And they have a deal at the end of their ministry called Sheep Week. And they literally take them to an area where there are sheep that have been uh, newborn, so to speak. They haven't attached to the local shepherd yet. And they have to carry around and keep track of their sheep. And it is quite an experience. They have to sleep out there. They have to be with them for one full week. And um, talk to anybody who's been to Patmos about their sheep week experience. Now, the problem is we get duped. We listen to other shepherds' voices. In fact, sometimes as Christians, we listen to this culture that has kind of repackaged Christianity into an easy believism or a prosperity, theos uh, prosperity uh, theology gospel uh, maybe a watered down deal. And that is the voice we not need to be listening to. We need to listen to the authentic voice of Jesus Christ. Well, the thief, it says, uh, breaks in, steals, kills, destroys. And we need to understand this. The solicitation to sin is always going to be disguised. In fact, 
painful consequences are always cloaked in temporary pleasure. And though tempting, the result is tragic. I don't think anybody gets to the end of their life and says, man, I wish I would have sinned more. I wish I strayed more. I wish I would have gone off the deep end more. Well, the second character are gatekeepers or hired hands. You see that in verse 3 and verses 12 and 13. To him, the gatekeeper opens, a hired person. He who is hired hand and not a shepherd does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, and what does he do? He books, he gets out of there. Like, I'm not dying for these sheep. I'm just a hired guy, you know, making 15 bucks an hour. I'm not putting my life on the line. I'm not the owner. And so he flees because he cares nothing for the sheep. So hirelings run from the trouble where the shepherd um, takes care of the trouble. They run away from it, uh, the hirelings, and not to it. Uh, by the way, anybody who's ever had a college student or a young adult who lived in your home and you said, someday you'll take pride of ownership in your own home. In the meantime, when they lived at your home, it was kind of like a free-for-all and they didn't ever do the dishes and you're always like, yeah, you leave such a mess. And um, not to throw my son under the bus, but he is prime example A of that. It was awesome. I love the day four years ago when he bought his first house and that pride of ownership. And I can't believe how neat his house is, except for his bedroom, but the rest of the place looking pretty good because of pride or ownership. But the other thing is I'm thinking about is if you are the owner of something, if you're an owner of a business, yeah, you're going to take responsibility. And yeah, man, if someone tried to rob you, you'd probably say, yeah, you're not taking money from my cash res register. I was thinking about this because when I was 16, I worked for Robinson May during the Christmas vacation. And I had to close on Christmas Eve night when I was 16. And in our particular top department, I was breaking several thousands of dollars, maybe bigger than an offering here at ABF on any given Sunday. And I'm talking 6,000, 7,000, 10,000, 20,000. I won't tell you them out, but it was a lot. It was a not enough to escape to Tahiti and live happily ever after. The thought did come to me for about one nanosecond and I realized you're a fool. You're not doing that. But everybody's gone. The escalators have stopped and I've got saddlebags worth of cash and checks and gold bullion. Well, no gold bullion, but I had all the other stuff. And I was thinking, if I had ever got robbed on my way to dropping that off, I'd say, hey, 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 it's yours. Take it. Here, let me take it to the car for you because I'm not dying for Robinson May's haul on Christmas Eve. See, that's exactly what he's talking about, the hired hand. He's not going to die. There's one guy who died for you, Jesus Christ. And maybe some of you would put your life on the line for your family, but it's God through his son, Jesus Christ, who died for you. The third character in the story are the shepherd, aka the owners. And you see a lot of verses, 2, 3, 4, 11, 14, 15. Be it he who enters the door is the shepherd, verse 2. Verse 3, the sheep hear his voice. Verse 4, they follow him. They know his voice. Verse 11, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 14, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Verse 15, the, just as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I put a picture of Keith Green on the slide behind me because it represents one of kind of my heroes in, in music way back when I was in high school. And I remember the day he died in that plane crash in Texas. But he had this group of songs that that album cover represents was some of the most profound music I ever listened to as a kid. And that shepherding theme came throughout that music. Well, the last illustration or character is the door or the gate. And again, he says, I am the door of the sheep. Verse 9, I am the door if anyone enters and then verse 16, this is interesting. He says, I have other sheep. In other words, not just the ones I'm taking care of. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. What's that about? Well, what he's saying is, eventually this gospel message isn't just for the Jews. It's going to be given to the Gentiles. And he is the one flock, one shepherd for all people. And in fact, he makes that I am the door. That's another one of those I am statements in John. I am the great shepherd or the good shepherd. Now, it's interesting because through this whole context, you think that everybody's tracking with them. They're getting it. They understand the analogy. It makes it, it's as clear as mud <laughs> to the disciples. Look at verse six. He said, this is a figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand. 
what he was saying to them. So he goes through all of this. It kind of not only confuses uh, the Pharisees and religious leaders, but even the, the disciples weren't quite sure what this all meant for them. So as we look at this passage, it might, and if we're compared to sheep, what are the concerns of sheep? And I would suggest the same four concerns that sheep have. We as God's children, aka sheep, we have the same concerns. So what do sheep need? And what do we need? Well, first of all, no matter where we are in our spiritual walk, we need superior assistance. In other words, we sometimes find ourselves in trouble, don't we? And we need to be rescued. And so the principle is we need someone to do what we cannot. Sheep would often get caught, they get stuck on their back, and they'd have to be rescued, and they get themselves in all kinds of trouble. Maybe we do as well. Secondly, sheep need sensible approaches. They, sheep often would get lost, they need to be found. We're often lost. In fact, before Christ, we were completely lost. And so what do they need? They need someone they can depend on. Thirdly, sheep need secure affirmation. They're vulnerable to predators and they need protection. And they live sometimes in fear and they're scared. Who's the, who's the apex predator in our life? Well, I would say it's Satan and his minions. Now, I'm not a big see Satan behind every door kind of a deal, but I do believe there's spiritual warfare going on in our, in our world. And we need to be secure and affirm that God has got this. He's got you in the palm of his hand. Even in 2020, when you wondered where the next dollar would come because you lost your job, there wasn't another paycheck. There was no end in sight. And so we need someone and they need someone who comforts and protects them. And then lastly, we need and sheep need sensitive attention. When they hurt, when they hurt, they needed medical treatment. A shepherd would nurse a lamb back to health. Sometimes Christians, we're at the worst at shooting our own spiritually wounded. In fact, we need a shepherd who understands when you mess up, you don't need to be lamb blasted. You confess the sin and yet you need someone to come and help you pick up the pieces. So fourthly, we need someone who is caring and willing to invest time. So look at that in summary, someone to do what they cannot, someone that they can depend on, someone who com comforts and protects them, and someone who was caring and willing to invest time. Well, we'll wrap it up here in the characteristics. So what does this good shepherd look like? Because this is who you're placing your life in, in this person's hands. His name is Jesus Christ. And so the overall characteristics of a good shepherd is kind of like buying an insurance policy that bundles your home, your auto, your fire, all of that into one. It gives you peace of mind, as the insurance company says. Well, God gives you this umbrella plan of protection, and he expresses it in four ways. And we see this right from the text here. First of all, he gives us direction. Look at verse four. He leads them. He's our strategic planner. He has brought out all his own. He goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Sheep need to be led. They're not, not to be prodded. And so the shepherd's out front. He prepares the way. Look at Psalm 23 again, all the things that he does. Secondly, the characteristic of a shepherd, a good shepherd, is he gives purpose. He gives life. Look at verse 10. This is a famous verse that we quote, and no one knows. The, it's in this context of the shepherd deal. The end of John 10, 10, I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly or fruitfully. In other words, man, no matter what happens, he's giving you an abundant life, not a bummer life. He's given you a lot of adventure and it's got some twists and turns. We get it. But the question today, and, and as we finish up 2020, the last Sunday in December, are you on full or are you, are you running on fumes? You know, ultimately, you got to find your purpose in life. And if, if you haven't found that purpose in life, I would suggest Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord is the greatest starting point for finding that purpose. You know, that book by Rick Warren, Purpose Servant Life, sold like 60 million copies over the years. We have to find that purpose in life, and he gives life. Then he gives us salvation. Maybe the most important thing, he's willing to die to save us. We see that in verse 11, 15, 17, 18. Again, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life. I lay down my life. I lay down my life. Shepherding is risky business. He says it four times. If anything's mentioned four times in like five verses, you better take note because that means this is serious business. And shepherding's risky 
business. Do you know, I did, this is odd research, but 4%, that's 250,000 sheep die a year here in the United States from predatory animals. Now, more die through disease and other things, but 4%. David fought lions and bears and stuff, and ultimately, he's the shepherd, God is, that fights Satan to the death by dying on the cross. And so he lays it down. And what that means is verses 17 and 18 is a reference to the crucifixion. It's a setup, not a takedown. It was by design, not disaster. It was the beginning, not the end. The cross was the strategy, not the tragedy. Ooh, that preaches the cross. Write that one down. The cross was a strategy, not a tragedy. And so the resurrection was God's ultimate answer. And the victory lap was made and Satan is ended in anguish and defeat. We know how the story ends. Then lastly, what does a good shepherd do? He provides connection. He knows them intimately. You see all those verses, three, four, 14. The sheep hear his voice. They follow him. I know my own. They know me. And so ultimately, it's not complicated. The bottom line is God has a plan. He wants to connect with you, but you got to listen to him. You got to follow him. It's very personal. And so you can see, how has God met you? He's given you direction. He gives you purpose. He gave you salvation. He provides connection. And so ultimately, that brings us to our call in life. As we land this plane today, I want to suggest two things. What voices are you listening to? It is so easy to slide into listening to life apart from God. And that life is full of despair. We were made to connect with God, not to live in isolation and separation. And quite frankly, it's been a tough year for some, right? You've lived in isolation. You, you haven't been able to come here. You're listening to this service for maybe the 30th or 40th time uh, this year. You've been online listening to these verses and preaching and Pastor Scott and Pastor Josh. But we were not meant to live in isolation. So the good news is you don't have to live in isolation with Jesus. And there will be a day. There will be a day coming soon where we don't have to live in isolation from one another as a body either. And then even more importantly, he knows your name. So I want to suggest that even though 2020 has been rough, there's a better day coming and God knows your name. He knows your name. So you got to trust him because life with the shepherd brings hope. You say, why did you put this picture as you finish this sermon on the screen behind me? It's a picture of a shepherd and sheep in the catacombs, underneath in the catacombs in Rome. And do you know that the shepherd and the sheep picture, especially that with the one carried on the shoulders, is the most painted picture in the catacombs. You see, early Christians knew that when times got tough, the thing that they would cling to is they knew they had a good shepherd who ultimately had their best interests at heart. And so would you bow your heads and close your eyes for this last Sunday in December of 2020, I want you to think about your relationship with God, even as Chad plays underneath. Heavenly Father, I pray right now that we would hear you, listen to you, know you, spend time with you. Lord, we kiddingly said this year couldn't end too soon. And yet, Lord, we know that ultimately with you in charge of our lives, you as the great shepherd, the good shepherd, that ultimately you are our protection and our provision. And you do things for our protection and our provision and ultimately promote your glory. And so Lord, once again, we entrust our lives to you. We give it to you. We rely on you. And may you take us through this COVID storm safely to the other side. And Lord, we willingly want to submit to you. And so maybe some of you have wandered and I'm looking at you right now. And as you look at me, I want to say that it's time to come home. Maybe you've been a prodigal. 
Maybe this season has caused you to rethink where God fits in your life. We'd be so happy to hear from you if you just made this decision today to say, I'm coming home. I'm done wandering and come to the good shepherd who wants nothing more to have a relationship with you. If you've been staying the course, way to go. And you keep listening to his voice. Listen to what he wants and let's believe God for great things in 2021. And so Lord, we ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our good shepherd. In his name we ask, amen, amen.
ABF family, we're so glad you spent this time with us. I hope you have a wonderful end of the year, and we're looking forward to seeing you again in 2021. Remember, Jesus wants a relationship with you. He is your good shepherd, and we're so glad that we get to be a part of his sheep family. Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a great rest of your holidays and into the new year. We'll see you soon.